I want to officially welcome you to our Immersion Future of Work virtual roundtable series. Today, we have with us JFF Labs, part of Jobs for the Future. We are going to be talking about preparing employees for the future of work, the impact of immersive learning. So we're very excited to have them on board. We'll learn a little bit more about them in just a moment. I'll kind of put some names to the faces here very quickly. As I said, my name is Jamie. It's Jamie Thomason. I am a simulation specialist and a learning partner here at Mersion. Today I have with me Dr. Carrie Straub. Now Carrie is our executive director of education programs here at Mersion. And Carrie was also, and still is, an integral part of the team that is engaging with JFF Labs currently. And so I'm really excited that she's here to help assist and answer some of the questions and be another great voice of immersion. So some of you that join us on a regular basis might have some questions that Carrie can answer that maybe we haven't touched on in the past. So I wanna say welcome to her. Thanks, I'll be manning the chat, yes. Yes, thank you, thank you. <laughs> we have Kat Ward, who is the Managing Director at JFF Labs, and Steven Yadzinski, who is the general Acting General Manager, and we're gonna be welcoming them and learning a little bit more about their work and our work together in just a little bit. All right, we're gonna give everybody a few minutes to get settled and get on here. I wanna officially welcome you to our Immersion Future of Work virtual roundtable series. Today, we have with us JFF Labs, part of Jobs for the Future. We are going to be talking about preparing employees for the future of work, the impact of immersive learning. So we're very excited to have them on board. We'll learn a little bit more about them in just a moment. I'll let you know, uh, kind of put some names to the faces here very quickly. As I said, my name is Jamie. It's Jamie Thomason. I am a simulation specialist and a learning partner here at Mersion. Today, I have with me Dr. Carrie Strobe. Now, Carrie is our executive director of education programs here at Mersion. And Carrie was also, and still is, an integral part of the team that is engaging with JFF Labs currently. And so I'm really excited that she's here to help assist and answer some of the questions and be another great voice of immersion. So some of you that join us on a regular basis might have some questions that Carrie can answer that maybe we haven't touched on in the past. So I wanna say welcome to her. Thanks, I'll be manning the chat, yes. Yes, thank you, thank you. Uh, you might also see uh, Amy Parente hop on in just a little bit. She's coming from another call. She is the engagement manager that is on working with JFF, and so she's going to be a great resource as well. But speaking of, we have Kat Ward, who is the Managing Director at JFF Labs, and Steven Yadzinski, who is the General Acting General Manager, and we're going to be welcoming them and learning a little bit more about their work and our work together in just a little bit. So to let you know what's going to be happening, I'm going to give that brief introduction of Mersion for anyone who is new to us, just so you have an idea are these people and what do they do? We're gonna let Steve and Kat lead our presentation. We're actually going to view a simulation. We're gonna, in real time, let you experience one of those scenarios that we developed and are delivering alongside of JFF. And then we're gonna leave some time for Q&A. Now, as always, we call these roundtables because we want you to be engaged. It's not just to sit and listen to webinar. So first and foremost, we're gonna practice using that chat function down there. So I'm sure we're probably all well-versed in Zoom at this point in our lives. <laughs> but just in case, down at the bottom, there's a little bubble. If you click that, it's chat. It's gonna show a screen to your right. Go ahead, use that drop-down menu. Make sure that it says um, panelists and attendees. And then that way everyone can see what you're putting into that chat, please. And in the spirit of that, go ahead, say hello. Let us know where you're calling in from today. If you don't mind, share with us your title or your, your area of focus. That really helps us kind of know where to direct the conversation so we know who's coming from where. With that, we'll get things started. So if you are new to Mersion, 
We are a VR company for practicing essential workplace skills like leadership, communication, and empathy. We provide virtual environment to practice difficult conversations, whether that's challenging a motivating and underperforming team, de-escalating inner office conflict, adapting and integrating different work styles, or providing that safe and inclusive work environment. You will find us in the leadership and development space. We work with sales, customer service. We actually work with some call centers. As you can imagine, we do a tremendous amount of work in diversity and inclusion. We really have for the last couple of years, that seems to be a great focus, as you can imagine, in the current environment. So we are really amping that up. And what's exciting to me is that that leadership and development space and that DNI space is really coming together because they really should be included as one. And this is a Jamie speech. Um, so I'm just excited about that. We started out in education as a research project at the University of Central Florida. It was funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. It was designed for pre-cert teachers to practice classroom management and content delivery. And actually our very own Carrie was a part of that project. So that's uh, something that if you wanna delve a little deeper into that, you can reach out to Carrie. She has some great insight there. We have also branched out into the world of healthcare where we work with doctors and clinicians on bedside manners, delivering difficult news. And we actually work in the defense area with the Air Force on their intelligence. So we're a little bit of everywhere. Now, how it works is we have that live human in the loop. We are the only place where artificial intelligence and a live human is combined to drive those avatars, to drive that simulation. That live human is called a simulation specialist. You heard me mention that that's my background, where I come from as well. That simulation specialist can parachute into various avatars to deliver scenarios in customized environments so that your learners can gain the confidence and the competence to go out and actually utilize those skills and have those difficult conversations in the workplace. They're not afraid of them. They feel good about it. And that's what we're going to talk about today is how does that work? Does it work? And we have our dear friends from JFF Labs. I always throw in these bio slides so that when we share the slides, you have them with you. The only thing I'm gonna talk about here, uh, Kat, I noticed that you actually started in theater as a director and producer and educator. So we might have to talk offline because that's my background as well. And I find it really interesting. I, I think there are a lot of people that I know probably because it's the world I come from, that come from that performance world that head into that L&D training world. So I'm excited to learn more about that at a different time. And uh, then we also have Steve Yagodinsky with us, and I'm gonna let them explain a little bit more about what JFF is, what our engagement is, and let you take it away. Thank you so much for being here with us. All right, great. Thank you so much, Jamie. I appreciate it. So I'm, I'm waiting for the, the deck to come up here on my screen. And while you're doing that, I'm all right, put on my glasses and see who's calling in from where. <laughs> Fabulous. All right, we've got it. Okay, so hi, everybody. We are so excited um, to be chatting with you. So Steve, if you could move me up to maybe the, the opening slide here, skipping me ahead a little bit. Um, so what we're going to be talking with you about today is we're going to share a few things with all of you. Um, really at the heart of our presentation today, we want to take all of you in on exploring immersive learning and specifically what immersive learning can do as a tool to help people unlock economic opportunity and mobility. That's really the focus of the work that we do at JFF and JFF Labs um, and the heart of everything that we do. And so we're going to be talking to you a little bit about, first and foremost, what are some of the general overall themes facing our country right now with regards to our economic crisis and how that impacts economic mobility and, and where that impact is most acutely felt. Um, we'll talk a little bit about JFF and the work that we do, and, and then we'll go into a case study that we've got going with a company where we're actually applying Mersion as a solution that we think is, is driving some really exciting results. 
Um, and then after that, we'll end with a simulation. So you'll actually get to see some of it in action and in play with one of our colleagues who's joined us on the call today. So let's dive in and, and start exploring here. So where I wanna start this conversation, Steve, if you could advance me a slide here, is to actually take a step back. And before we start really digging in on who's JFF, what do we do? Um, I want to take a look at where we are right now with regards to our current economic situation. Next slide, please, Steve. So if we go back just a few months um, and we think about the beginning of 2020 in January, we were actually at the top of the longest expansion in our economy that we'd experienced. Our stock market had been growing for over 10 years. That was a new record. Um, and we were feeling a lot of economic gains and a lot of um, positivity. People felt as though there was going to be a recession at some point. We didn't know when it was coming, um, but we were generally speaking feeling, feeling pretty good and we were considered at full employment. But even then, even at that time, we also knew that income inequality was one of the biggest problems we were facing, one of the biggest challenges we faced as a nation, and that was a major concern, driven by a lot of the factors that you see here on this slide. Um, so we really felt as though there was a lot of talent out in the world, but opportunity for that talent was certainly not equitably distributed. And that was before things got difficult. If you could advance me a slide, please. Then the unprecedented um, experience of COVID hit, and that really changed the game dramatically and quickly um, for everybody, for all workers. But specifically, if you take a look at this slide, there are some populations that have got Hit, and hit harder than others. So for example, people who do not have a high school degree have experienced um, much more hardship and are experiencing a lot more of the economic um, downturn and the brunt of that right now. Um, women over men are, are really um, experiencing a lot of, of the challenge here, as well as Hispanic and black populations. We have more than 56 million people who have filed claims for unemployment. These numbers I mean, the word unprecedented doesn't really even do it justice. It's, um, we're in really a challenging um, moment right now for our country and all of us are trying to figure out how do we start to right um, write this ship. Then if you could advance to the next slide, we have another compounding factor here that is making this situation particularly challenging, which is that as COVID-19 has hit and as this economic crisis has hit, um, we're also really seeing a lot of trends um, in technology and advancements in technology start to pick up. So as people have been displaced from the workforce and they look to where they may be going when they return, those jobs that they're returning to are starting to look really different. Um, so where it might have been an interesting theoretical conversation about the future of work prior to COVID hitting, now it has become something that is very real, very felt by people. And the world of business is really scrambling to keep up with where are jobs going and how do we prepare our people who've either been displaced or who are working with us, but may not yet have the skills they need to be able to move into the jobs that are coming. So these are some of the, the compounding factors um, that, that are really facing our, our country right now. And I've really just mainly focused in on particularly the economic factor, but we are facing a variety of crises, um, a, a healthcare crisis, a, a crisis around racial justice and inequity. Um, all of these things compound to make this um, a very unique moment in our history that we're living through. So if you could advance to the next slide, Steve. Um, JFF is, is highly activated in this moment. Um, we have for the last, we're a nonprofit organization that is 37 years old. And through the course of our time, we've been thinking deeply about the issue of equity and economic opportunity and mobility. It is at the center of everything that we do as an organization. We're always thinking about how to create more access to learning that is tied to in-demand occupations and opportunity and pathways for people to advance um, economically and, and through their lives. Um, so if you could move to the next slide here, Steve. This tells you a little bit about what we do here at JFF. Um, we really root a description of our services in that we design, scale, influence, and invest. 
Um, so we turn our expertise in the worlds of education and workforce, and we really try to bring those to bear at scale um, for people to create widespread equity and economic opportunity. So in designing solutions, we work with a variety of partners, everything from traditional to innovative workforce partners, um, traditional and non-traditional education providers, the private sector, which we're going to dive into a little bit today, um, to help them think about how to solve some of the biggest um, equity challenges we're facing um, in economic opportunity. We take those ideas to scale and we're gonna speak a bit here, my colleague Steve is gonna speak a bit about how we think about technology and its relationship to scale and how that comes to plan our work. In our 37 years, we've been building networks across the worlds of policy, education, and workforce, and we've really been, um, you know, working to influence across those. And finally, we have a whole arm. Steve got a little ahead of me here, but I'm still on the other side. <laughs> one back, Steve. We'll get there in just one moment. We also have a whole arm that's dedicated to investment and um, investing in, in what we think are the most promising um, offerings out there to help them grow and, and um, thrive. So I mentioned, well, now we'll go to the next slide here, Steve. So I mentioned that we um, work with the private sector and we really see tremendous opportunity for impact and scale in the actions that some of our largest employers take. So much of our work is actually focused on trying to build um, new mindsets, strategies, and, and on the ground programs that really directly impact um, workers and learners through the actions of these companies um, and, and all of the you know, Fortune 500, but then even beyond that. So we work in deep partnerships with these companies. If you could advance to the next slide. What that tends to look like um, in our work with companies is specifically working with them on two categories of work. One is their talent solutions, and we'll, we'll get a bit into this as we talk a little bit about our case study. And the other is in social impact solutions. These things are tightly tied together and oftentimes overlapping. So with regards to talent, where our focus is helping companies build strategies that put people at the center of their business strategy and that really see the well-being and economic mobility of their workers as a big part of their strategy. So it's that, that um, stakeholders versus shareholders type of focus. And then in the social impact side of things, um, we can work with companies to apply our knowledge of what works in, um, for learners and workers and what really creates the most economic opportunity. We can bring that to bear, whether it is within their own talent strategies or their social impact strategies. So we can advise on those things. If you'll move to the next slide, this, um, this framework here is what we call our impact employer framework. In all the work that we do with companies, we're guided by a belief that every company can become an impact employer. And these are companies that, as I mentioned, they're putting the well-being and economic opportunity and advancement of their people at the center of their strategies. They do not believe that there needs to be a trade-off between doing well by your people and doing well by your business. And so we help them think about the traditional ways of, of approaching um, you know, the, the talent um, management um, whole spectrum here of things that include workforce planning, talent acquisition, talent development, total rewards, ethical offboarding, corporate culture. We'll look at those issues that a talent manager is thinking about and we'll layer onto that. How do you think about these things from the vantage point of creating opportunity and advancement for your people? So for example, with talent acquisition, we may help a company to tap into underrepresented um, talent pools within their, their regional area. Um, within talent development, we may help companies build upskilling strategies. Within total rewards, we may help them think differently about um, what their approach is to flexibility for their, um, or supports for their hourly employees. Within offboarding, we may say, you know, how can you think differently about offboarding so that it's not just one moment in time, but really you're thinking about preparing your people for a bridge into their next opportunity. So those are just some of the examples of ways that we work with companies to think differently about talent um, and to really benefit as a business by putting people at the center. So I want to get back to that, that approach to technology and how we think about tech as a real force for good. And I'm going to pass pass the control over to Steve, who will walk us into that. Thanks, Kat, very much. And uh, hey, everyone, great to join you all today. You know, one of, one of the things that um, 
I'm not sure sure Kat mentioned is that you know JFF and JFF Labs we're we're a nonprofit, right? So so we really sort of walk the walk around social impact. Um, and one of the things that uh, we do at at JFF Labs is to think about how we sort of realize Kat's vision at scale. And so that's where a lot of our work comes in with respect to technology. And we'll we'll be focused on immersive, but just to give a little bit of setup in terms of how we think about technology. I mean, I've, I've always been um, interested in sort of like how things actually work, right? So like, oh, that's terrific that we want to create sort of impact and business value simultaneously at scale. But what do you mean by that? How does that work? How do we, how do we actually get that done? And, you know, some of what we want to do is not only, you know, for, as a nonprofit, you know, surface and learn from technology, but we're really interested in, in, having a certain lens that we apply as we evaluate potential partners. Um, we did this with Mersion, we do it with many, many other partners where we might have insights about what's gonna work best that other firms may not have. Uh, we're able to leverage JFF's more than 35 years of uh, experience across workforce and education. We have a policy arm. So there's a lot of knowledge that we can draw on so that we can understand how best to identify, select, and then scale uh, solutions that work. Again, animating some of Kat's vision. So uh, I've known Mersion a long time, and I, and I thought I'd, I'd talk a little bit about that. We recently did a, a market scan uh, focused on immersive learning technologies. Uh, we can share that as a follow-up for attendees. Um, but I've always been impressed with Mersion's approach uh, for, for being able to uh, train something that is traditionally incredibly difficult to have good outcomes around. I've been around many traditional workforce learning and development programs where you have sort of, you know, cohort, a classroom setting, sort of role playing for soft skill development, and they never seem to sort of hit uh, well. They also, um, you know, were difficult to scale. So they were expensive to produce and so forth. And so we wanted to start thinking about how we address soft skill development, uh, some of the other pieces that Kat was talking about at scale. And, and Mersion was, was, a, was a, a, a potential partner that I had been following for a long time. But just to talk a little bit about, you know, why immersive learning? Why did we start focusing on that? Um, you know, and when I say immersive, I mean VR, AR, sort of all mixed together. There's a lot of different sort of like pieces of tech that come in, but, you know, one in every three small and mid-sized businesses are expected to be piloting VR by 2021. That's remarkable. Um, you know, if you look at how many headsets are sold, if you actually look at the 2019 to, to the 2021 numbers, it's exponential growth. Um, and you know, just the, the, the adoption of these technologies is, is really important. One of the things that I think happened was the consumer market you know, really got to know VR for gaming and stuff. And it, it's sort of like, I don't know if that worked as well, but once enterprises started getting into it for learning and development, it, it really started to take off. And I won't read Josh Person's uh, note here, uh, but you know, it's just tremendously impactful and, and growing in terms of its reach. Uh, let me get back to the deck. So in our market scan, we had a few um, takeaways that uh, basically immersive learning works. Um, it, it is not, you know, there's no sort of like, if it's designed well, if it's, if it's deployed intelligently and so forth, uh, the, the technologies work really well. They're, they're, they do, you know, develop the skills that they're designed to develop. VR uh, leads for now. Um, you know, Immersion is a virtual reality uh, platform. Many VR companies also allow their content to be accessed via sort of regular computer screens, which is a huge uh, leg up for many of the folks that we're trying to reach because, you know, VR headsets are, I mean, right now, as a matter of fact, they're hard to, hard to get your hands on uh, in, in certain ways. But VR leads for now. At the same time, over the next, you know, two to five years, we think augmented reality and other technologies will come in. Um, and prices are continuing to drop, making these sort of innovations accessible to more, to more folks. Uh, um, and the social impact potential is just tremendous is the last point that I wanna make. I think that the efficacy, the ability to bring people in and have uh, real uh, tangible learning outcomes that 
that you know people learn the skills they're they're hoping to do i think i think is is an important piece um, so thinking about some of what Kat shared, how we sort of get it done at scale, thinking about the role of technology, uh, setting a little bit about immersion, I wanted to talk a little bit about a case study uh, with uh, Prologis. And for folks who may not be familiar with Prologis, uh, they're, they're sometimes called like the landlord to Amazon and Walmart. You know, they're, they're a large real estate uh, company and the real estate that they own is uh, logistics and warehouse facilities. And we've been working with Prologis for almost a year now. And they came to us pre-COVID and said, you know, we really are interested in a talent solution that will sort of address some of the retention challenges, some of the impression that people have of the industry generally. How do we attract people into the industry? How do we sort of create a point of view that is like sort of join the logistics team um, for a job, but leave with a career? You know, how do we create sustaining career paths uh, Prologis wanted to be a leader uh, within their industry. They were interested in developing a curriculum. I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and then we also wanted to think through the strategy for making it work. Of course, COVID hit um, and everything changed. So we, we changed our strategy a little bit with Prologis and we're now uh, working on a rapid reskilling program, which we can talk a little bit more about, but really we're, we're focused on attracting uh, unemployed workers into the industry uh, logistics is expected to grow uh, over, over the coming months and years. Uh, consumer behavior is permanently changed. And so Prologis thinks that there is a huge opportunity for uh, effective talent solutions that not only connect people into logistics as an industry of choice, but also connects them to pathways where they can grow while they're, while they're working within logistics. So our approach currently has uh, four central components. Uh, we are building a custom curriculum. Uh, this curriculum will be focused on logistics and management. We also have other uh, partners, including Mersion, that are delivering training. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. We're also uh, establishing an online learning platform that brings everything together in a centralized place and we can scale. Uh, Launching um, a program like this, we want to tell the world about it. So mobilization and outreach campaign, both at the national and regional levels. And we're reaching unemployed workers through a network of community partners that, that JFF has available. So we're, we're bringing all of these elements together, the strategy and the skills and how do we develop a curriculum that we built in 2019 um, and, and into 20. How do we scale that through technology in an online centralized learning platform? How do we distribute that through community partners uh, and reach unemployed workers? These are the folks that have connections to them. Those, by the way, might be, um, uh, might be uh, community-based organizations, workforce centers, other, other organizations like that. And then finally, how do we tell the world about it and get people in there? So, you know, JFF is able to execute on a comprehensive suite of uh, sort of systemic components that, that create uh, impact for, for individuals and, and our partners. Uh, so I will really quickly talk a little bit about this because we're going to move to a demo here in a second uh, simulation with, with Mersion. But we wanted to work with Mersion to focus on supervisors in logistics. Supervisors in warehouses are often uh, sort of the linchpin around retention, um, you know, efficiencies, as, as you can imagine, and so forth. And so we really felt like Mersion would be a terrific tool to be able to use for people who are often promoted from within sort of the frontline worker uh, class. They're, they're becoming the supervisors of people who were previously their colleagues. And how do we help people with that transition and develop some of the skills uh, to, to, to manage teams um, and, and get their, their work done. So we'll move to a demo here, I think in a second, but just really quickly, I think we've actually done uh, four scenarios total now. Uh, two of them are on time challenges, somebody who is uh, you know, consistently um, not on time. Another is losing control of emotions in a consistent way with your workers. And these simulations allow managers to practice these challenging conversations in a safe environment uh, within the Mersion platform. So I will hand us over to uh, the simulation and um, Audrey from our team will be sort of pinch hitting as, as the supervisor for us. So uh, over to the simulation. 
Great. Thank you so much, Kat and Steve. Really appreciate it. And as Steve said, we have Audrey who is joining us. Audrey, if you want to say hello and just tell everybody where you're joining us in from. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Audrey McHale. I'm part of the JFF Labs team, and I'm joining you today from Vienna, Virginia. Now, Audrey, you actually are part of the JFF Labs team, but not part of the project with Mersion. So you're not That's really correct. familiar with these simulations. So just like any traditional learner would be, you're stepping into this cold. Is that correct? That's right. I'm a total noob, so you're with <laughs> okay. me. Just wanted to share that, lay that out, you know, so uh, part of what we're going to do is that feedback at the end. So be as good or as bad as you want, because then that gives us something to talk about, right? <laughs> so <laughs> to that end, we are going to share with you one of the simulations that we have created along with JFF Labs. We're going to bring in our host, Maya, to say hello. Hi, Maya. And just very quickly, for those of you wanting to see this, if you just want to make sure you go up to the top of your screen, and hit view options, and hit side by side mode. Because if you do that, then you will see the screen and you will get to see Audrey as well. I'm going to take myself off camera here and uh, we'll have Steve do the same so that we're not distracting. And Maya, I leave this in your capable hands. Enjoy, Audrey. Thank you. Certainly. All right. Well, hello. My name is Maya and welcome, Audrey, to your simulation. Now, I'm going to go ahead and share a slide with you and read it aloud while you read along silently. Are you able to see the slide? Yes, thank you. Excellent. All right. So in this scenario, you've recently been promoted to manager and you need to give feedback to your direct report, George. George has been coming in late recently. Over the last two weeks, George has been more than 15 minutes late four times. His tardiness is affecting his coworkers who are being forced to cover his responsibilities and has resulted in a project delay. You and George were co-workers before you were promoted and you suspect he may be taking advantage of your past working relationship. Now your goal in this conversation on the right hand side is to understand the cause of George's tardiness and to gain his agreement to improve his behavior. Some strategies to consider are to listen to understand George's perspective, share feedback in a direct and caring manner, and describe the expected behavior and work with George on how to achieve it. Okay. Great. All right. Do you have any questions about the scenario? No, I think, I think I'm ready to go. Excellent. All right, so as mentioned in this scenario, you'll be having a conversation with George, and your goal in the conversation is to understand the cause of George's tardiness and gain his agreement to improve his behavior. So what will happen next is I'll disappear from this chair and George will appear. He can see and hear you, and at any time you can say pause or end simulation, and I'll come back and we can debrief on how the simulation went. Let's go ahead and get started. Audrey. Hi, George. How are you doing today? I am. It's, um, I'm all right. Middle of the week. Been a busy week. Always. Things are fine. Good, good. Um, George, I'm, I'm really glad you were able to take a little bit of time um, to talk with me sure. today. I wanted to, sure thing. yeah, I wanted to have Audrey? a conversation with you. Yeah. Um, so, George, I've noticed over the past couple of weeks that you've been coming in um, at least 15 minutes late on several occasions. Uh, George, can you tell me what's going on? Audrey, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's just what, 15 minutes? I'm, it's not like, I'm not falling behind on my work or anything. I mean, I, mean, I, I take care of my work, everything's on track. It's not a problem. Uh, well, George, you know, we do have uh, rules and we are expected to start work at a certain time. Is there something that's going on? You Can know, you help me understand the, what seems to be becoming a pattern, frankly? It's, it's um, Audrey, I, I mean, you, you know me, uh, we, we work together, we work together. I take care of things quickly, There's nothing to be worried about. I, you know, I, I've covered for others. I've covered for others when, when they've had things, we all cover for each other here. And, and it's just a few times. It's just a few times. 
George, I think, I mean, certainly we can talk about the speed of your work, but I'm really interested in your timeliness and that's important too. Uh, just want to try and understand a little bit more. Is there again, again, something I can I, help you with? Is, is this really, I, I, I understand you've, you've just gotten promoted. I, I get that. I get that. And I know you're trying to lay some ground rules, but is this really the conversation we need to be having? Uh, George, I think it is. And, you know, my promotion doesn't change the rules. Um, and I don't think this is really about me, actually. What? What? Well, come on, Audrey, we've worked together. You know, you know, I'm efficient. You know, I don't cause problems. It's, it's, it was just, you know, sad. A couple of personal things happen, and and it's just it's just been uh, you know just a couple times, a couple times, and again I can do I can do the same amount of work that someone, you know, the rest of the team might take eight hours. I can do it in six. George, I'm really trying to understand the situation here. Again, you know, my objection isn't the quality of your work um, or your speed, but your inability to show up on time every day reliably is having an effect on the rest of the team. I am not late every day, Audrey. Well, George, I didn't say you were late every day, but well, it has become- Well, you're inability to show up every day. It's, it's it, you know, there, we, we all go through things. We, we, we you know, life, life happens. We, we have little things. I mean, I have a few things happening. We cover for each other when things happen. That's, that's all I cover for the others. I, I, don't, I don't know how else to tell you this. And, and you, I mean, you, you, you work with me. Come on, we work together. That's right, George. And that's why I'm frankly surprised by what seems to be a pretty new pattern. And I'm not really sure what's going on. Um, certainly we cover for each other. I'm not denying that. But, you know, there's a difference between having an occasional or an exceptional situation that happens to all of us. We're talking now about multiple times in a two-week period, and I'm just trying to understand how I can support you and what we might need to do to address this problem. Look, I, it just car problems, all right? All right? My car broke down. My car broke down, and my wife and I are sharing a car. I, I mean, you had, I've got two kids to take care of in the morning, six and eight, try to take care of that. And, I mean, honestly, I, I think 15 minutes late was pretty good to, to try to take care of two kids and get them out the door. Uh, my wife's doing the best we can. They're, they're trying to drop me off. I mean, I, I don't know what else to say. We, we, we have one car. That's, that's, that's where we're, we're, we're at right now. George, I, I okay. do understand, and I appreciate you sharing that with me. I think the thing I'd like to try to do in this conversation is figure out how we can make some adjustments or um, how I can support you, because the reality is I do appreciate where you're coming from, and, and certainly challenges happen to all of us. You've got a lot on your plate, um, but we do have... And you are still getting here, but I would yes. like to figure out, is there um, a way that we can start to address um, what might be happening on a regular basis so that we can support you in getting here on time, you know, regularly? Audrey, it, it's not, it's not a regular basis. It just happened a few times. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know. I can't, I can't tell you. I can't tell you when the car is going to be fixed. Uh, I don't know how much it's going to cost right now. Well, George, do you think that there um, are some other ways we can overcome this challenge at a minimum, maybe let someone know if you're running late? I think that that would be a start. I, maybe, uh, maybe, I guess, I, you know, I, it's, it's hard, it's hard to say how the kids are going to react in the morning uh, at any given day. Uh, I don't know if you, I don't know if you understand that, but. I do, I, and I appreciate what you're going through. What would you suggest? What do you think would be an option for us? Uh, I mean, I, 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 I can, sure, I, I can let you know if, if the kids are just not getting out of bed, uh, but it's, I, I'm doing the best I can, Andre. Uh, you you know I do. I and, do, and uh, I just I don't I don't know why. Again, we cover for each other. I don't, I don't know why I'm I'm being called out for this. I mean, honestly, it's it's just I'm I'm doing the best I can. 
George, I, I really don't want you to feel like this is a personal attack. First and foremost, I really want to try to understand what's happening. You're 100% right. We absolutely cover for each other. But, you know, there is a bit of give and take as well. And the team is starting to feel like there are um, some issues with slippage and some threats to some of the projects that we're working on. So we do really need to address it. And I really want to hear from you um, what would be effective? What do you think would work for you? Let's try and, and problem solve in a way that's going to meet your needs and recognize um, what's going on in your life right now. I, 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 can, let, I can let people know. I, I, I can give you a heads up. I I don't I don't know. We're just I mean this is new. My my wife's probably uh, having the same conversation with her work. She's had to be later than I have, and and we're just trying to deal right now. Um, so that's that's. I, I I can I can I can give you a call a heads up if I'm if I'm going to be late. Well, George, I appreciate your willingness to think through some solutions with me. I think we're both looking for the same things, right? We just want to do our best and, and want to get to a Definitely. place where we're doing great work. Um, I appreciate your, your willingness okay. to have the conversation. Okay. So you'll right. be letting us know if that. I'll, I'll let you know. I'll let you know. I'll let you know, Audrey. Okay. And certainly we you know, want to work towards minimizing the number of days when you don't come in on time. I think that's the ultimate goal. Does that seem fair? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's fair, Audrey. And, and, um, that, that, that's, that's fine. I'll, I'll do that. Thank you, George. I you know, really appreciate your openness and your willingness to, to problem solve with me. Thank you. Sure. Can I, can I go now? I'll, I'll go ahead and get back on the floor. Absolutely. Okay, we'll end. All right, welcome back and great job. I'd like to take a little moment to do a quick debrief of your scenario. Now, in your simulation, what's something that you feel you went well, did well? Um, I think I kept my cool. I, you know, felt at times my blood pressure rising a little bit. George was sort of challenging yes. me. Yes, George was giving a fair bit of pushback and, and I can understand uh, how that, that might cause those feelings. Now, you did a really nice job of staying calm throughout the situation. Uh, great con eye contact, your body posture. These are the first things we see in any conversation. They can help create a safe visual space for conversation. And I did notice that George was uh, very open with sharing his feelings with you. Now, if you had a chance to do this simulation again, what's something that you would have done differently? Oh, I think I, I didn't quite get him to really kind of commit to what is the way in which we're going to move forward and, and solve the problem. I think as, I only got as far as, well, I'll let you know and I'll try and call. So I don't know that we totally solved it in one conversation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was trying to be sensitive to George's needs, but I didn't necessarily get a commitment to do things differently. Yes. And, and so what were some pushbacks that you noticed or some tactics he was using and, and, and George was using in negotiating his way out of this conversation? Yeah, he did a couple things that were really um, tricky for me. One was he said, mm -hmm. you know, we all cover for each other. So that was yes. tough. And, and he tried to conflate um, the quality and speed of his work with arriving on time. Uh, which I was trying to keep separate. Um, he also challenged me as a new manager and sort of tried to diminish or belittle my attempt to uphold our standards and rules. Um, yes. And I think he also, yep, sorry, go ahead. Oh, please. Um, and then I think the last thing he did was to say, I can't possibly predict um, when I'm going to be late. It's out of my, he really didn't take ownership or control. Um, he was really trying to deflect that, um, that responsibility. Yes. And I also noticed that throughout that he was, he was using his, his, the familiarity you had, this personal relationship with you to try to, um, 
have different treatment uh, than, than the rest of the employees would. Okay. And uh, really nice work with, with countering that, with sticking to the message of, of the purpose of the conversation, uh, why this, co this behavior needed to be changed. I noticed you were asking some open end questions to get some more information. He did share that he had some personal issues regarding his transportation. However, that's not really, can't really be used as the reason for his tardiness. Um, and so finally, what are some questions uh, that you may want to ask George if you were to have a similar conversation in real life to really get him to have a little bit of agency in in finding a solution to this issue yeah i really i really struggled with that um i wanted to try to get george to problem solve um and to mm -hmm. you know figure out like what is the what is the way out of what's become a bit of a pattern yes. um yes and i really struggled with that that's something i would do differently and thank you so much. And I, I know really, really, again, nice work of, of negotiating, really taking his pushbacks, acknowledging his situation, but still taking his pushbacks and, and shifting that perspective, shifting to that, that perspective of still finding alignment with what the needs of the team were, what the needs of his role were, and the company as a whole. So nice work in, in this was a very tricky conversation to be having, and uh, you did a really nice job of, of really sticking to switching those perspectives around, and then, um, and now, again, thinking of these these possible uh, next step forwards, uh, some questions you can have for George to reflect on the situation. Great, all right, well, thank you so much for feeling, being willing to dive into this simulation. I really appreciate it. We're gonna switch you back over to the rest of the team for debrief. Thanks, Maya. Perfect. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you so much. So first off, Audrey, how did that feel having that conversation with George as an avatar as opposed to, you know, just another person on the other side of the screen? You know, I, I have to say, like, I didn't really think of George. I was really engaged in George's challenges and didn't really think about um, George as an avatar. I was very much like, okay, how are we going to solve George's automobile problem? Like it was, it became very real very quickly. Um, yeah, it felt, it felt pretty authentic and, you know, George's tactics of deflecting and, and, you know, conflating different things. I'm, sure I had have had conversations like that over the course of my career and it's hard because it um, he really pulled a lot of the personal information into it and I mm -hmm. struggled with depersonalizing showing empathy but then like okay how do we pivot to a solution right nicely done well I'm gonna turn things over to the experts Kat and Steve to to continue that conversation and invite anyone that has any questions or comments uh, be that for Kat, Steve, myself, or even Audrey, uh, then please put those in the chat comments. We've seen a few uh, coming through. Uh, just observations of, of making some adjustments sometimes for those that, that are having personal situations and how you do that. Uh, but he was really giving you some pushback and taking in some circles, so nicely done. Thank you. I would, when I heard him go, Audrey. I was like, oh, that would have got my blood boiling. <laughs> but you handled it really calmly. <laughs> Thank you. I thought what was really interesting, Audrey, also in your approach was, I mean, the conversation went on for a while, right? But what it ended up doing was in one way really diffusing and de-escalating um, at a certain point. And I think that he was really able to feel a lot of empathy and understanding from you. But also it was interesting that you didn't get that firm commitment from him to change his behavior. He didn't say at any point, I'll make it work. I will show up on time, which watching that, I sort of was waiting to see. So why did you choose to stop at basically forcing as the supervisor him to say, I will not be late again? Um, I think I chickened out, honestly. Um, it, George was really very effective at um, getting my, getting my, blood 
you know, rushing a little bit. He seemed to be challenging my authority. He, you know, I wasn't, it felt to me like I wasn't making progress, getting him to feel ownership over um, any change. I really struggled with that. Mm. Right. You know, one of the things, and um, one of the things that I think is so effective about immersion as opposed to other kinds of uh, human skill development, by the way, I saw the chat. I agree with that. So I, I've been doing this long enough that soft skills is sort of like, you know, I don't know, it's, it's just automatic. But yeah, human skills is a great way to describe it. Um, is, you know, Audrey, I, you know, you, I'm sure would have some ideas of what you would do differently. And I think that you know, when we're talking about that phenomena, phenomenon of having your blood boil, those are, those are the kinds of real emotions that immersive learning can allow people to feel. And one of the reasons why JFF has been so committed to uh, immersive learning as, as a tool to use, right? And there, there's lots of things going on. And, and by the way, like, you know, people are learning to be brain surgeons in immersive learning. You know, there's, there's all sorts of, of applications for it. But in this realm of, of you know, those, those human skills, I think that they've been so amazingly difficult and expensive to train for such a long time. And, and you know, those systems that allow people to actually feel the emotions, it, it, it keys into this neurological system inside of us. Um, that, that allows us to, to reflect on the conversation more substantially. Uh, it allows us to, you know, sort of have more motivation for doing it differently the next time and not sort of blowing it off and so forth. So anyway, just a yep. little bit of my perspective on it. Exactly. And what an incredible development experience for people um, as their new managers or as they're looking to grow certain skills and proficiencies as managers, or if you are interested in even becoming a manager and you want to experiment with that, this is the kind of environment where, um, you know, it becomes a safer environment to experiment with these things, but you still experience the intensity um, and it can be more readily available. You can do this from your own home. You know, there, there are just a lot of reasons that kind of up the accessibility factor for it, um, but that keep the impact factor high, um, which I think is, is really great. And particularly with our work, which is really about trying to, again, create that opportunity for people um, and create moments of reflection, even just with Audrey here, like, we could have said, let's give it another go, but this time here are a couple of notes and ways to do this a little bit differently. And we want you to push them all the way to actually saying, you know, I, this won't happen again. Here are the adjustments you can try or, or she could experiment with that. So this allows you to do that, which is really great. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm seeing lots of great chat. And uh, thank you, Carrie, for, for following along. And I loved, Sarah just mentioned, she said, I think the simulation is potentially more authentic, despite being an avatar, than traditional role play might be. And uh, we actually do have the research that shows that the use of that avatar actually does allow the learner to dissolve those social constructs that they hold, be it with another person, particularly someone that they might know if you've ever done traditional role play, oftentimes it becomes awkward, sometimes even comedic. But mm -hmm. even if you were to say, Carrie and Jamie, you're going to do this role play, but I've never met Carrie before, I still might look at her and go, she looks just like that woman that nabbed that last role of, you know, bounty paper towels that I needed off the shelf last night. And so I'm already biased against her in my own head for whatever reason I might have. But having something that looks about 80% real, but having that 100% authentic conversation actually, uh, research has shown, allows the learner to really buy into that in a, in a deeper and a more authentic way and stretch themselves and take better chances. And I know that um, we've got another question sort of about the platform and how it works. So just very quickly as a a review again, we have that simulation specialist. So we do have that live human in the loop. There is always that human being that is part of that process working alongside that artificial intelligence. So it's not a branching, something's not designed in advance. It's a true authentic conversation. And so this just sort of gives another kind of visual aid of what that sim specialist is on the one side. We can see and hear the learner because that tone of voice, those facial expressions, the fact that I, you know, we've had learners that that think it's all a machine, so they pick up their phone and the avatar is like, 
what are you doing? Is this not, is this conversation not important to you? Fine, I'm out of here. And they're like, whoa, 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 wait, I actually have to be immersed in this. This really is immersive. Uh, and so those SIM specialists can actually parachute in and out to up to four adult avatars in the same scenario at the same time so that you can have that conversation. And that's just kind of a, a little visual. So if you have any more questions about that, please feel free to drop, drop those in the chat. But I just thought I would go ahead and, and pop that up for you. And we do have about five more minutes. So we would love to get any other responses, any other comments or questions that we have along the way here. And I know uh, another interesting fact that I think we have, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share this one because we did a little research on how long it takes to master these soft skills and actually make a change in your life. And what we discovered is just in your daily work life, real life, just seeing how it goes and adapting and making those changes, you can actually sort of change that habit usually within a year. If you employ video or coaching and debriefing, those are usually about three months. Video, you don't get that authentic practice and coaching is often that one and done and pretty expensive. Facilitator training with role play, again, often one and done and a little harder in today's environment. And what we've discovered with Mersion is that what we're saying one hour, four 10 minute simulations, two half hour sessions in there are enough to actually physically change the brain, to actually change that behavior. Carrie actually explains this beautifully. I'm gonna let her do that for me. Oh my gosh, I'm typing mid chat, asking, um, answering questions about accessibility for, um, for learners. So I was divided my attention. What do you want me to speak on? I'm happy to do it. Oh, absolutely. Sorry about that. Didn't mean to sneak up on you. <laughs> I'm, okay. I'm just going to tap into your expertise because you so beautifully explained the, the research around those four 10 minute simulations, that hour within mm. Merchant, how that can physically change the behave, behavior. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and Sarah, I will get to your question around disability, um, but- you, I've interrupted her, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we found that after four 10 minute sessions, we were able to change a targeted behavior. Um, we followed people out into the workplace and compared their, that same dosage with 40 minutes of online interactive training with um, the simulation. And lo and behold, the simulation, it's applied learning, it's experiential learning. So you learn better by doing. And we found that they did, the ones that had done the simulation significantly outperformed their peers in the workplace. So we were really, really excited about that. Um, and the question I was fielding was around disability and how, how do we work with learners that may have some special needs in online environments. Um, and so one of the things that we do is we work via the Zoom platform and Zoom is fully, they are fully accessible. They have VPAT, uh, VPAT statement on their website. And um, so it's similar to having a scribe in a class if you're, um, if you're needing somebody or having some, an interpreter online, just depending on what type of supports that person would need. The software itself, we don't do real-time transcripts with the software. It's not, we're not capable of doing back and forth and um, with the learner and the avatars at the same time. So typically we'll have a third party join the call. Great, thank you for that, Carrie. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, I went ahead and popped this up. This is some contact info. If you wanna reach out to Steve or Kat or Carrie or myself, we're always happy to connect to answer questions. I will, as I mentioned, include this slide, which has a little more information on Kat and Steve themselves, as well as all of the contact information. And we are approaching the top of the hour. We only have a couple of minutes left. So I'm gonna invite you, if anyone wants to share anything, ask any other questions, to go ahead and do that at this time. And, and I'm on my laptop, so I'm building new things, <laughs> trying to share. Like so. being in a new Zoom room. It is. Well, and I feel naked the because I usually have, I usually have my headset on and you know, my little um, Princess Leia ears. So. <laughs> <laughs> we'll give people a minute of their lives back, it looks like. Absolutely. We're ending a minute early. <laughs> so, so enjoy yourself. This time, I really do want to say thank you to everyone and a special thank you to Kat and Steve and to Audrey for coming in and yeah. jumping in and brave thank and Carrie for joining me as well and to all of you thank you for visiting with us and we'll see you next week bye-bye thanks everybody thanks Stay everyone safe. bye JFF bye. labs thank you. <laughs> bye.